Welcome to the Voodoo Power Podcast. Welcome to Plates of Pancakes. We're sitting down today with Sebastian D.G. Impalo. Coach D.G. Impalo is a graduate assistant strength and conditioning coach at East Central Oklahoma and Ada. He assists with football, volleyball, track, and cross country. He is a graduate of Pacific University. So welcome to the show, Coach. Hey, happy to be here. Thank you for having me. So your last name is Mouthful. What are the what are the what do the athletes call you? I don't go by my last name just because of that. So I just go by either uh, my first name, Coach Sebastian, or uh, because uh, I was previously a aquatic athlete, I have them call me Coach Seabass every now and then. You played water polo at Pacific, which I have never talked to a water polo player. That's just totally rare for the area I live in. Is that pretty big out where you're from in Long Beach? Yeah, in Long Beach, it's pretty big. But I mean, um, once you leave like, the west coast or even uh certain parts of the east coast uh, you you hardly see it or even hardly have people that know what the heck it is <laughs> now right now it's really cold all over the midwest so coming from long beach to ada how are you adjusting to the cold i'm, I'm, I'm adjusting as, as fair as i can uh definitely bundled up um, i took everybody's awareness of hey you should probably get yourself a heavy jacket and uh, no more flip-flops and shorts. So got myself some joggers, did exactly that. Um, when my heater was broken, I got, thankfully bought myself a electric blanket to keep me warm. So yeah, we're, we're all ready. Now, I don't know a whole lot about being a graduate assistant. What are the perks of going to somewhere like East Central and becoming a graduate assistant strength and conditioning coach? How does that work out? Yeah, so uh, at least here in East Central, um, the perks were I get uh, out-of-state tuition to pay waived, and then I've been blessed with getting uh, housing and then a small uh, meal plan with a small stipend. And then because it's a smaller school, I um, was given the privilege of being able to really coach, be more hands-on than I ever have before. Now, what brought you to East Central as opposed to another school? I, the opportunity just brought itself. Um, I was applying to a lot of places, talked to a lot of coaches, and I uh, talked to the head coach here. He said, yeah, so when do you want to start? And I was like, oh, all right, shoot, I'm down. I've been all over. We we can do this. <laughs> Sometimes great opportunities fall in your lap. So what's the plan after this? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I'm hoping after this uh, I just – get a full-time uh, assistant position. I'm very open-minded, so I don't care where in the country, and I don't care what teams. Um, I view athletes are athletes. We're looking for just certain movement patterns. So as long as I do my research and understand the sport, I can get by. As long as I communicate with my coworkers and talk to my past mentors, um, I should be able to handle whatever whatever comes my way in the future. Now, are you looking at the collegiate level, the high school level? What, what's your thought process? I'm more leaning towards the collegiate level because that's the only experience I've had. Um, but, I mean, that's me trying to stay comfortable talking. If a high school position opened up and I applied and they offered it to me, I, I would take it just so I stay in the field and get a different kind of experience. So, all right, I'm not getting guys that are being recruited here and – you know, if you're at the higher level getting paid more than me or something like it's really with guys that I, I would say more, more of like a grand spectrum of different talents. Now, you know, you're a graduate assistant, so that puts your age right there with the athletes. What are the advantages and disadvantages of essentially being the same age as the kids you're coaching? Yeah, I, I would say the advantage of it is um, I'm more able to relate to them and be able to speak their language more than somebody that's a little on the higher age. Uh, but uh, definitely disadvantages are like, I, I am a grad assistant, so not um, official on staff. I'm on staff, but not like I'm an assistant strength coach or the head guy. So right away, just trying to not demand respect, but trying to earn it through them. I'm also their age. So a lot of them, you know, you got to, really be able to explain yourself of certain things and really when you present your program explain why we're doing certain stuff so that they have buy-in and trust um, the process that i'm trying to have them go through 
the soft skills of coaching. You, you're trying to earn athletes' respect. What, what are the areas in that department that you need to work on compared to what you think you're good at? An area that I need to work on, uh, that's uh, the head coach, he, he's helping me a lot with is just uh, having a bigger confidence in myself in talking to that big group even though there are guys that are older than me and girls that are older than me as well. Uh, just knowing, hey, I, I know what I'm saying. I'm presenting something that I really believe in. I need to just trust that I show it to them and they'll be able to trust me later on. Now, kind of in what you're saying, that dealing with the big group on top of instructing a big group, where does imposter syndrome fall into there? Do you deal with that or are you good? Uh, sometimes you got to fake it. A little bit you know try to like hide the nerves so for me like to what helps me is trying not to be silent like even if it's just shouting uh, the sets and rep schemes um, just repeating it so they don't even need to look at their sheets or ask amongst each other I just stay loud repeat that and it usually helps me even uh, forget that the nerves are there kind of building on that a little bit more there is so much to learn about everything you're doing. You've got the sports to learn, the athletes to learn, just how to run a room. All of these things combined, and I'm sure it gets overwhelming. So aside from your staff, where do you go to find resources to help you? Yeah, so um, I use a lot of Google Scholar to just see what the new research, what the new science says from people way smarter than me, epidemiologists. Um, and then I also talk to past mentors that I've gone through, uh, ask their opinions. Um, I show them what I'm about to program and ask, Hey, is there any adjustments you could lead me towards? Not just tell me what it is, but if you can just guide me to a path that could be more efficient. Um, that's what I typically go to. And then, uh, big names. I like to watch their podcasts, how they explain their reasoning of doing certain stuff because uh as, as you know yourself uh there's a bunch of, there's so much information of how you could do things to lead to the same goal it's just what what matches you what do you um comprehend best at so in saying that who do you like to listen to uh, i really like uh listening to tyler henry from university of tennessee and then uh joey from fau i i really uh he super smart but he's able to dummy it down to where i can understand what he's talking about and that that's where i love the most so i'm like hey i just don't don't say the science words like talk to me like a regular human being so i can understand what what you're trying to inform me on so he, he does a great job doing that yeah coach Garacio was kind enough to come on the show early on. The audio didn't turn out like I wanted, but the conversation was amazing. And, and what he's doing with time and eccentrics and all that stuff, you know, I, I really think that as far as the country goes, he's a, he's ahead in a lot of areas. Yeah, even his explanation of, like, the benefits of why to do certain um, times of isometrics, I was blown away because... I'm still young. I'm still learning this. And I was like, oh, I thought isometrics was just like, oh, you uh, do a squat and pause at the bottom. But then he was talking about uh, how do you can potentiate with it, how you can actually use that as like um, a max effort kind of deal of, all right, put as much force into it and it won't tax you as hard in terms of, not neurologically, but it won't tax you in terms of muscle damage. And I, I, ju I was blown away i was like oh okay so this is a nice tool that i can use <laughs> i caught a podcast the other day i think on table talk with uh josh bryant and he got into that a little bit and setting world rec records using uh isometrics right before he hit some of his guys hit the platform so that creates a whole new way of thinking for sure yeah just just seeing that and then um just to talk about how yeah we constantly do that in uh strides or even like, like grappling sports or uh even for like a shot put track athlete like they still use it and then 
yeah, I just, uh, I was blown away of how he was able to connect to so many different things than just, oh, it's just you're holding statically. This year was the first year I think that I really realized how important isometrics are for the grappler, the wrestler. Uh, it really opened my eyes, I guess, as you do this stuff longer and longer and longer, it's amazing what you pick up on. Yeah, yeah. Like, um, I used that for volleyball after I watched it. Uh, whenever they had a game, like the day at the next day, I was like, okay, how can I, instead of taxing them real hard in terms of like getting some kind of muscle soreness, what do I do to fire up that nervous system? And I was like, okay, here's a tool. And uh, it came out really well. They gave me great feedback. It was my first time with them. So I was constantly like, hey, let me know if it was too much. Um, because you're here to play a sport, not here to set like world records in powerlifting or weightlifting. Yeah, we used it yesterday for some kids that uh, they've kind of been stuck on their deadlift. So we set up a an ISO deadlift before they hit their max set. Now, their max set still wasn't as awesome as I would have liked to have seen it, but they were able to pull more weight than they'd ever been able to pull before. Okay, yeah. Like, yeah, that's that's awesome to hear. I think I saw you, you post it on your Instagram. I posted uh, the ISO today, and then I figured I'll post the deadlift tomorrow to kind of build on it, you know. But uh, they had a little hitch. Yeah. They had a little hitch in there, but they they hit they hit some PRs they were happy with, and then once that mental blocks broke, hopefully we can we can keep building onto that. Okay, that's awesome to hear. Now, matching your ideas, I mean, everybody has a bias. You have a bias. Your head coach has a bias. The assistants all have a bias. Understanding that, how do you guys all work together to get one idea out to the athletes? Um, uh, although we're, we're biased on like certain ways of programming itself, um, we, all, we all came into the conclusion, uh, hey, it doesn't matter what, what we're looking at. We're looking at certain patterns. And so that's what uh, here amongst the staff at ECU, we look at, okay, are we seeing, seeing that we're touching a horizontal and vertical push? Are we doing a horizontal and vertical pull? Are we do, doing a squat? Are we uh, doing single arm and single leg movements? Are we hitting a fast plyometric? Like that's what we're looking for. And as long as we are able to explain to each other of why we're doing like uh somewhat what we're doing like linear or if we're doing an undulated kind of periodization to control volume it doesn't matter we're just like are you hitting these these type of movements and then are we seeing like what a great progression like because we we're all open-minded about hey there's there's multiple ways that could work and then we hitchhike out each other and go like oh that's a great way of doing things oh actually i, I like that a lot and then we start implementing it in ourselves. Now you work with uh, cross country athletes. So the weight room in cross country, how do you work that out? Cause I'm sure most of them do not want to be in the weight room. They would rather be running. That's what they enjoy. So getting them in the weight room, what are you kind of looking for out of those athletes? Yeah. So for me, uh, yeah, they, most of them are not uh, big fans of lifting weights. They think it's going to, hinder them more than anything else and so what i try to do is more of educate them and go like hey i'm not here to i try to really stress i'm not here to make you like a 500 pound squatter i'm just here to create less of a risk of injury that's what my job is for you as long as i can reduce the amount i can't fully get rid of injury like it's gonna happen um, as long as you're an athlete, injury is going to occur, whether it's something small or something like we, we need surgery. But if I can reduce it and lessen the risk, then I'm doing my job. So I just analyze and tell them, hey, these are the usual spots. Like we usually have feet. They're, you know, plantar fasciitis is very heavy with them. Um, their knees take on so much force. So then they start having uh, patella tendon issues. And so I just implement programming and explain to them, hey, we're doing this so that we can be able to absorb force greater. So now your knees are going to feel better or, hey, we're doing this to strengthen your feet. So that way 
if the base is strong, the rest is not going to take so much of a toll in trying to compensate for these weak areas. Uh, so I, I just try to do that. Uh, some of them started to join it, and then others, they, they're still like, oh, whatever, dude. You're just saying that to get me to like this. And I'm like, okay, well, as long as you're doing it, I'm fine. Uh, they don't they don't talk back. They're very respectful. Um, so at least in that sense, and uh, you j for at least this program, I just have to be more on them of trying to push them a little harder. Now, I know you're a West Side guy. We follow each other on Instagram. So whatever I like a post or see a post, it comes up. Who else you know may have liked it? So I obviously know yeah. that you enjoy that stuff. Plus, your posts relate to a lot of a conjugate style method. Keeping that with the cross country idea, Louie was really big on sled drags for time for endurance athletes to keep the volume down and, and keep them from running so much. Do you guys implement anything like that or do you talk about those ideas that Louie may have had? Yeah, so uh, we mentioned it. Um, I, I've been the most about Westside and reading some of the books that they've had and articles. Uh, we just got sleds. So now we're going to start implementing them and start uh, brainstorming together about uh, what we could do for speed work and what we could do to also use it as a way to improve um, sprint technique. Um, because uh, a lot of guys, they when they're in their acceleration, they like to just come straight up right away. And it's like, no, dude, if you want to be able to push forward, you have to apply force into that direction and then slowly grad gradually come up in order to maintain top velocity. But so using like heavy sleds that they're forced to stay in that angle and hopefully become familiar with it. I think that's a great idea. And you can load that sled. Now, this isn't my idea. I only thought about it after another really good coach started talking to me about it. You can load that sled for where you want to work in the acceleration phase. So by however ha heavy you make that is where it's going to get the work. So if you're near isometrics, you're going to have the first one to three steps. You lighten it up, then you got your four to six steps and then so on and so forth, because as the sled comes through gravity, it gets faster. Is that along the lines of what you guys are thinking? Yeah, we're, we're thinking of doing something similar to that. We're thinking of, okay, uh, more of a stationary thing of, uh, we're going to start with a station of we're going to use prowler sleds to go heavy. Um, just be able to train them to apply a ton of force into the ground to move forward, followed by then using a, a carpet sled with like 45 to 25 pounds to be able to sprint like a 20 or a 40 yard dash. Um, it's somewhat of a, like a potentiation kind of deal, but it's, it's another form of doing what you just mentioned without having to like, take off the plates afterwards uh, the only reason why i like the prowler maybe there for a little, little bit longer is because you have to hold body angles was the only reason why i was thinking that you have to hold those body angles longer where if it's a bag pulled behind you they can come at, like you said earlier they can come up into that top speed maybe a little quicker than what you'd like yeah that's um uh, that's what we noticed a little bit of the winter break with some of the guys and girls that stayed behind uh here uh here at ecu uh we noticed like they were still doing that right away until we started implementing a slow down right here. Then we noticed there was a little more of a delay of them wanting to come back up. Now, when you set that up near isometrics, everything gets really slow and it's almost like a wall start. So when you're watching that, what do you want to see in their, in their plant leg? In their plant leg, I more just want to see, um, not a complete vertical shin angle, more going a, a little horizontal, but uh, more of like staying on the ball of the foot, not still being on their heel. And where I was going with that and, and asking about that a little bit is let, let's go to the back of the leg. You know, mm -hmm. I, th I think everybody understands shin angles and, and what it should be in that driving force, but you're, what are you looking for in that hamstring and glute? Yeah, so like there i'm still learning um more of sprint mechanics um we're lo literally all learning about it together because none of us are really a speed expert uh, what i'm trying to see is not too much of a leakage 
at the moment where you see that little back slap uh, coming along. All right. I'm okay. wanting to see that so no hyperextension of the hips will ha occur and we're able to utilize all of our energy properly. Um, that's as far as my knowledge goes. Um, I'm sure somebody that's a speed expert, they, they know about that transfer a little better than me. Well, you kind of headed down the area I was thinking when you said leakage. It seems like you put even some really fast athletes in a situation like that, and you'll see a bend behind the knee. And I just don't know that they're absorbing force 100% for a sprint. And if you could get that in that isometric state to handle more, get straighter, and hold that, maybe your sprinter could apply more force and carry that longer. I don't know if you've thought about it that way or if I'm totally off base there. I haven't, I haven't thought of it that way. Uh, it sounds like it's on something, uh, but I, I do agree. Like the, the old athletes tend to um, not typically track athletes, but athletes that it's not their sport. They just go with what naturally feels correct. They do too much of a back slap in the end or um, like a tail tail end with their legs and that's where you see the lower hamstring usually collapse and that's where you hear them say oh i pulled a hammy um at least that's what uh i've noticed through watching them run i don't know if i'm seeing it right St again i'm still young trying to figure it out <laughs> where i noticed the biggest carryover wasn't necessarily in sprinters but in linemen mm. because it seems like if they can absorb force in that back leg they can isometrically hold that longer where their chances of holding that block just improved. Where if they collapse in that back leg, they'll get overran if the kid opposite them is better at that aspect. That's a good way of looking at it. <laughs> I didn't even, I, I'm now thinking about it when I've uh, watched all of our games. Um, whenever they got beat, that, that actually makes a lot of sense now thinking about it after you said that. It, huh. it, I don't know. It seems to me like you've got to get everything slowed down so you can see it. I mean, I don't know that, I mean, other than that, your top speed guys, how can you see it at, at full speed? But you put them on that isometric sled. You know, I don't have a shred mill. I'm sure if you put them on a shred mill, you see the same thing. But I mean, I don't have the money for that. So we've rednecked it into a sled and then tried to make it work to our best <laughs> advantage. Now, teaching that second step, let's get into that second step. Are you teaching a low heel? Are you teaching a, a hard dorsal flexion? when that drive foot comes off the ground. Yeah. So when that drive foot, mm -hmm, as you were saying, sorry. Oh, and, and I, I was going to clarify the question, but I think you were heading down the right path. I mean, you don't want the heel to touch, but you want that heel to be low into that next step. Am I thinking about that correctly? Cause if you're flexing the foot, the heel has to go down. Yeah. So like not a, a complete like dorsal flexion where my heel is striking first, but we do want it to be, toe heel not heel toe because if you're just staying on your toes now you're you're not able to produce as much force as a full foot but at the same time if the heel goes first are we transferring correctly we're not going into that uh shing angle that we're looking for to drive you forward um at least to my knowledge again uh speed is still a weakness of mine i'm trying to learn as much as possible this semester about it well, join the club, yeah. man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's been something that's been nagging at me to get better at, but uh, without talking to coaches, I wouldn't learn it at all. Yeah, I said you're like, um, even from a base standpoint, learned, I've learned a ton just by talking to different guys. Um, even, even the ones where at first I didn't know at all what they were talking about. I was like, what, what do you mean? What the heck? Because for me, when I when I run, I always did heel heel toe. I thought, oh, that's just how it's supposed to be, and I was like, okay. But at the same time, I was like, well, I am an aquatic athlete, so I probably have been doing this wrong my entire life. <laughs> so, just a, just a little bit more on that sled. Teaching that really good push away acceleration instead of a straight line sprint mechanic. How do you get that? instilled in there in an isometric force does it just occur because the weights are so heavy they can't go straight into it they actually have to push laterally 
yeah, just if you put enough weight onto it, they're instinctively an isometric is going to happen because they're trying to push it as hard as possible. And you got to add some coaching cues because some of them will try to like cheat it, uh, sort of speak, but natural, typically a natural occurrence will happen. Yeah, and that's the best form of coaching, right? I mean, if you can make a drill actually teach the performance, then you don't have to do near as much. Yeah, it makes it a lot easier, that's for sure. <laughs> now, I see a lot of the stuff you post, and it may be a lot of, of what you're doing. I don't know how much you do with the athletes, but it seems to me like you guys down there do a lot of conjugate-style work, or at least your background is somewhat that direction. How do you guys view that? Is that something your head coaches are about, or is that just something that you enjoy? I I more enjoy using conjugate because that's really all I know at at the moment. I've read a little bit of triphasic, and I use that more of like when I'm introducing or teaching movement patterns by using the eccentric and isometric blocks, and then I start ramping it up in the concentric block of implementing more of a conjugate style of adding the the multiple different efforts at once uh, but that's more of my style um the, our head coach he just goes based off of, more based off of like what the system says uh from the soviets and then um, our other coach um, she comes from an olympic weightlifting background and so she goes with more of an ollie mindset of how to train athletes um she's been helping me a lot because right now uh me coaching olympic lifts isn't the prettiest so i usually um avoid it and more use like uh, a different form of triple extension and deceleration patterns um so that i get a similar effect so she's been helping me a ton and now i'm going to be trying to use that as more of like a dynamic effort kind of deal rather than uh, the sub-max or maximal effort kind of stuff. Yeah, because if you're getting athletes in there that don't have an Olympic background, it's going to take quite a while to get them up to speed. So if you're hanging down on that explosive side of the strength curve, you could probably get some gains quicker. Right, yeah. So, uh, I mean, she, she had a ton of success with uh, our softball team. Uh, their performance was going up. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to keep learning from her. And then I want to try to implement it myself after she says, yeah, you got this. You've got the coaching eye finally. So I just stood by her and went like asking her, hey, am I looking at this right? So she, she helped me a ton this past semester. Now I follow a few softball teams on Instagram and kind of watch what they're doing. And man, I watch a lot of it and I'm wondering to myself, what does any of this have to do with softball? You know what I what I mean? Yeah. I, I, obviously, I don't coach at a college. I, I'm just outside looking in. How do you guys program the work for your softball team? Yeah, the way we we do it is um, we at first look at like what uh, what kind of energy systems and what movement patterns they typically use, and then from that we are like, okay, they're a very rotational based athlete. So sure, we got to work on like acceleration of rotation. But we also need to add, how do we decelerate into that rotation? Because if you swing a bat and don't have the muscles in the posterior chain to be able to decelerate you, you're just going to throw out your shoulder from just throwing a ball. And so we look at it in that sense. And then a lot of um, shoulder rehab because uh, even though softball um, isn't as aggressive as a baseball throw, we still see like, okay, these pitchers are typically going full games or even going like two games in a row. So we still have to treat them as if it was as aggressive as an overhand throw. So we, we treat both of them the same. And then when it comes to like lateral movement, we use it more of like different kind of plyometrics to teach the deceleration and the acceleration of it. Creating that explosive posterior chain. I mean, the hip, the hip is hitting and then driving off that back leg. What are you using to create an explosive hitter? So right now we use uh, bands for just rotational twists. We, if, so like an oblique twist um, or a pal-off press, 
we use that so you get some isometric in that rotation and then also you get acceleration while deceleration is happening from the accommodative resistance of the band and then we also do a lot of landmines to be able to help with that as well so she uses that and then also uh different kind of olympic lifts so sometimes what i've seen her do is let them just drop the bar not worry about it just work on the acceleration and then the catch will be the deceleration or just hold on to the bar so when you pull it down it inadvertently is going to work the deceleration as well all right so i got a few questions going along that lines i've been thinking about it a lot lately i have implemented like i should but heavy one arm farmers carries how much how much oblique gains could you get working athletes in that mindset i think it's a great tool uh, we have done that before and we even uh started noticing the limiting factor has been their grip strength although they they need that a ton uh, it depends on like what phase and what uh what part we're looking at and so when we want more of an oblique strengthening kind of deal we uh slap straps on them and go like we don't care just go nice and slow and load it up as heavy as possible so that that's the way to really work on the isometric into our obliques while at the same time still getting some kind of like i guess you could say aerobic base because they have to move with a heavy heavy object okay and then you've talked quite a bit about uh, deacceleration so plyometrics for deacceleration how much do you add in there to create a deacceleration now i mean you get a softball girl in most of those girls from the area i'm from are not going to have an olympic background so you you want to get the acceleration taught quickly how do you achieve that so what what i observed from how she went about it uh her name's coach nally um she started with just using dc blocks to have a above the knee clean pools so just teaching the pool first and then teaching them to have it go along like a deadlift cloak to the body acting like it's going to untuck your shirt while separated with then afterwards after we're done with that with some kind of mobility paired with it we're then doing front squats and having them all do a front rack um, if they don't have the wrist mobility at the time we put straps for them to hold on to it and still get comfortable with the bar onto their shoulders but that's what i saw her do to naturally progress into there uh, into like a full clean now i've been running down this in my mind too we'll, we'll see what you think but uh you know it it seems like a lot of athletes will really take that clean to the floor before they get their butt stopped and then come up so if you was to rotate in in that explosive strength that 50 percent area 30 to 50 percent area of just the front squat a boxed front squat instead of a on the back um, speed squat. Is there any advantage to that? And would it eventually help the clean? Uh, she didn't necessarily use it, but I, I believe it would help just them getting through that mental barrier of, am I reaching depth and all that? So I, I like the box incorporated to that. And then also it teaches them to not just drop fast because then you're going to have two different spinal loads. So we tell them, hey, control the weight. And that way they're not hurting their lower backs. They're now hitting depth. And so when you get into the full clean, you don't see them do full separation where you see some ugly cleans happen where they go into like a sumo stance. They're now comfortable with that regular squat stance um, while it's being paired with that jump stance we want to look for in our clean pools and then our block cleans now talking about the box squat there a little bit i've noticed on your videos you you do quite a few of them yourself and you go to an extremely low box what is the benefit of going to that low of a box that you see for me like going to that low of a box is a great way for the off season to just create a ton of hypertrophy 
uh, work while also it helps you um, get through like a psychological barrier. Because now that you know you can handle going this low, you know like when the box is there and you don't, you just need to hit parallel, you got this. Like the doubt is not in your mind. Um, sometimes I'll add like a cushion to it so that way it um, kind of disrupts the force that you're trying to push off of. It's kind of like uh, Louis Simmons says, it's kind of like getting off of a couch. You know, you're on a low couch and you're trying to get out. It's a lot harder than if you were in a chair that's made of wood. So that's how I, I use it. I've used it with some of my track athletes. Uh, I'm wanting to video them more. Um, I just kept forgetting. I even forget myself to even record my own training to make sure I'm doing things properly. So I'm trying to I'm trying to be more on top of that. And I've been thinking about what Louis said there as far as, you know, setting it up. He would use foam a lot and and different things like that to absorb the kinetic energy so that everything created a, a stronger reversal. You had to produce the power as a, instead of storing it and using right. the stretch reflex. How much of that do you see a benefit in? For the guys that and girls that don't know how to like really show control, they just drop. Uh, I've seen a really good benefit of that in terms of like, all right, we're getting more control and they really know how to bounce out now. Because once they hit past like that quarter stance, they then know, okay, make a little dip and then they come shooting straight up and they're like, wow, that's a lot easier. And I'm like, yeah, it's because now, as you just mentioned, like energy can't be destroyed or just become nothing. Like it's stored somewhere. So now instead of it stored into a box or like a foam box being disrupted, now it's all going to be in your tendons, ligaments, and your muscles. Everything's just going to be stored in there. So I've seen a benefit of that. And then when we go into like more of a quarter stance to um, get more of that for my sprinters, more of that acceleration will hopefully it transfers over to when they run and they do a ton of hip extension and you don't see them ever do a full, full depth. I hope when they run, uh, hopefully it transfers a lot more. They're neurologically able to handle that load as well, especially the forces that they're going to be having to produce and handle when, you know, they're running, like when they run it, it's going to be more forced into the knees when they run than if even if I made them do a hundred or a nine hundred pound squat, like it just is. Uh, the amount of vol sheer volume as well, it's way more wear and tear from a sprint than any kind of squat I could give them. And back there a little bit, you kind of touched on uh, almost uh, thermodynamics, the law of thermodynamics, and and yep. that. Oh, so let no no that's fine. So let me throw this at you then, and see what you think. The more I'm around it, and the more I watch, I, I feel like the body's self-leveling. And, and I mean that by if you come out of acceleration on a sprint and you hit the top speed and that first step is a thousand pounds of pressure. If your body says it can't absorb that, the next step has to be less. And then the body decides at that step if it can absorb it or not. And then it does that until it finds the sweet spot that it can absorb and regenerate. I don't know if that sounds like anything that you, you guys down there have talked about or something you've thought about, but being as we're talking about thermodynamics and energy and creation of energy and dissipation of energy, what do you think? Yeah. I mean, um, it, it something I, I got the whole staff to start saying as well. Now, uh, it's my favorite quote from, uh, Louis Simmons and the West Side guys like we things break and so the body constantly wants to be in homeostasis it wants it, it's you can view it as either lazy or really efficient so if I'm going to run and I'm trying to hit a top speed and my body thinks it can't it can't handle it either I try to push it and something's going to give or exactly what you just mentioned my next step is going to be like hold up that first one was a little too much now I'm going to slow you down either it's um, intentional or not intentional that's one of the two is going to happen so if i expose you to a high high degree of neural adaptations to where your tendons and ligaments have to adapt to high forces then with obviously the proper nutrition and rest when you go into 
something where like you mentioned uh, each step is going to be about like a thousand pounds of force your body knows it can handle it and that's where like hopefully the less chances of injury will come about yeah and now that's where that's where i'm stuck you know you listen to really good coaches uh chris corfist and cal deets and and really get in that neurological pathway and if your body has to feel safe to allow that to happen so i don't know exactly where i'm at i don't know if it, if that's where it is if it's if it's a safety or if it's actually the ability to absorb so i don't have the background or the or the scientific proof but it's somewhere in there i think that it maybe it falls yeah that's the same with me like that's just stuff that i've heard and it's made the most sense to me from from previous uh mentors of mine and even the head coach which i view as a mentor now like what they've been explaining to me and i've come up, come to a conclusion okay if everybody is saying this even though i don't uh, fully understand the science behind it if all these coaches that have been in the game for this long are saying this is this is what we've been noticing i can't just deny it or say you're wrong they have way more experience than me they've seen th maybe thousands of more athletes than i have for sure so i'm gonna take it i'm gonna go like all right this this is what they're saying and they're reading from scientific literatures I have to abide by it and then try to match what they they've done themselves. So let me flip this on, on its head without getting you in trouble. Yeah. Do you, do you, <laughs> do you, do you think sometimes it needs fresh eyes? Yeah. I mean, um, there obviously there, there's certain guys that they're very old school. Um, they haven't read new literature or they're just stuck in their ways and they refuse to read anything new. So a nice set of fresh eyes is definitely, uh, I would say, beneficial. <laughs> but in the end, it's like, all right, if it stands the test of time this long, and I'm no epidemiologist where I'm doing like all this research and collecting all this data to try to prove something wrong, then at the moment, just because of how young I am and, again, I'm still fairly new to the field, I'm going to take it to heart that they're telling me the right information. Well, I don't think you're in any different position than maybe a coach that doesn't have a strength and conditioning background that gets thrown into the weight room like a lot of schools have to do. And that's why mm -hmm. I thought it was nice to sit down and do this podcast because I think there's a lot of coaches out there now that are looking for information that they just got handed something that now they don't know what to do. So if they can hear from other guys that are in that spot, surely it has to help somehow yeah for sure i mean the more the more minds you have and the more discussion that happens that's how that's how we evolve that's uh, just the nature of the beast of any field uh that involves just trying to advance itself like you can't be too close-minded yeah, yeah because what you think may not work might be exactly what that athlete needs yeah and it's like um it, it's pretty recent. Um, I, I forgot what I saw. I think I saw it on um, Coaching Strength Network um, talking about how research showed um, static stretching. It, it reduces power output. Um, so a lot of people just do dynamic stretching. But the coach mentioned, well, we had a ton of injuries. And so he started adding static stretching a little bit. Obviously, nothing too crazy of like a minute hold or something, but like 10 to 15 seconds of holding it and injury started being reduced and so it's like when you hear something like that it's like okay maybe we oversaw something or maybe the research wasn't as well constructed as we thought it was so there, there's those kind of things as well and in a lot of instances you're fighting research bias also so you have to know where you've seen some success and had some success and kind of take it from that angle sometimes i would think oh yeah 100 percent. like there's certain um there's certain research you look at all the references and see who funded it and you're like uh that's why uh, they're saying a certain route okay so it, it it just comes with the nature of the beast of like we have the internet there's a ton of books and a ton of guys that say certain stuff like there's so much um good good information and just as much bad 
<laughs> especially with the uh, athletes looking at like fitness influencers and what they say. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, I just, I hate to say I just got it, but it, I'd put it off for a while because it, it's pretty expensive, but I just got super training and you get to reading through there and it kind of breaks down how everybody did stuff different And the West decided that they were going to take a run at aerobic exercises. And they actually almost created a war against anaerobic. And that's why our aerobic base is so high today is because they did such a good job of propaganda way back when of discounting anaerobic work that now we're fighting it today. Oh man. It, it's funny that you mentioned super training because, um, my, my girlfriend, uh, she got me for Christmas super training because she kept on hearing me go like, Oh, this book is referencing super training. I've never even read this thing. I don't know what the heck it, it's trying to mention. And so she was like, Oh, okay. Keep saying this. She actually hears me complain about it because she's going into a physical therapy route and got me the book. And I was like, do you not know how much this thing is and how dense it is? Sheesh. All right. Thank you. <laughs> and you cannot well, buy it. You cannot buy it used cheaper than you can buy it new because there just isn't that many used copies out there. It doesn't seem like when somebody gets it, they hold on to it for a very long time. Yeah, that's, I mean, um, I was always told, uh, don't read that book until you have a basic understanding of exercise physiology and ex just general exercise science and you get your CSCS, so, like some certification that can get you through the door. Until you have those those things down, don't don't touch that book. And I didn't understand it until like more and more I, I've read some of West Side stuff. I went like, oh shoot, yeah, this does jack you up when you try to get certain certifications that um, open up the opportunity of getting jobs. <laughs> it'll, it'll make you deviate from what they want. Yes, everybody's looking for something. So right. you, you read too much of of Louis stuff and it'll send you down a bias that way. And so when you do study for those other tests, you have to look through it a totally different lens than, than what yeah. maybe you'd been reading. Yeah. It's like, um, you, if you do end up reading like West side's version of con like how they came up with the conjugate method, um, constantly when you read that stuff, you have to go in with the mindset of this is a power lifting biased author. Like he has trained a bunch of a multitude of different kinds of athletes, but in the end, his heart and soul was into powerlifting. And so you have to understand that before reading it. Right. And you have to take that program and adapt it to what athletes you have. That's right. the, that's the trick to it all. He was so good at it. He could take that program, spin it on its head and create something for sprinters. He could uh, take that program, throw it on its head. And now he's training MMA guys. It was just, he knew it so well. And then what the athletes needed, which not everybody has that gift. Yeah. And I, I mean, that's why I do like, uh, I wouldn't say it's like full on, like his style of kanji. It's a different form because I still haven't gotten that kind of mastery of it. Now you said your head coach had a Russian background. So how does your ideas of West side and his idea of a Russian conjugate, how does that work together and, and build on each other? Yeah. So like, uh, the, the only thing he has a background of it is more like how the system was. And then, um, what he's experienced through, uh, the other programs that he's been through, uh, he straight up even told me like, he's never read anything of West side. Uh, and I was like, oh, oh, okay. And so we would, we just talk about it. Um, I was fortunate enough to get exposure to how the system is written. So I was able to relate how he was already able to do his undulated kind of periodization. And I was able to go like, well, I go more of a linear style until we're in season. When we're in season, I go more undulated to match when we have games or not. Okay. So how do you do your in-season stuff do you do you lower the volume and go for heavier weights do you program the week out to build like for your football guys do you program the week out to build to saturday what, what are you looking at accomplishing 
Yeah, so it, it depends on how many days we we're given. So for for us, we only had two days with with football, and they had a lot of practices. So we had to stay mindful because it's a give or take. They're doing a ton of volume on the field, and this is where being able to communicate with your sport coach is very, very important. I think that's a good relationship with them is the number one thing as being a strength coach. Um, in my eyes, as at, as young as I am, um, they were doing a ton of volume. And so we were like, okay, they're doing a ton of volume out here. We just need to hit a huge stimulus of getting some strength adaptation and then make sure they hit sprint work because um, our, the coach uh, read literature about how you lose your speed, kind of the lose it or use it principle within three to five days. And it's like, holy shoot, you, you lose it that quick? That, that's it, it sucked when you told me that. I was like, really? <laughs> I mean, I could train super hard and in like three or five days, I could lose it all, huh? That's, you know, that's, that's a harsh reality. <laughs> that's, but, that's, that's kind of funny you say that, you know, they'll read that. They'll read you lose speed three to five days, but they won't read where you can maintain VO2 max for 28 days. Yeah, like it's, it's crazy. Like your aerobic ability. Uh, I like for me, I, I hadn't been in the water for a long time because I, I ended up moving out here and I went to my alumni game um, at my high school because I thought, oh, this would be fun. A couple of my buddies that I would never see are going to be there. And I was shocked how I got in the water and I was being out of breath as I thought I should. I was like, I haven't been, I haven't swam in like six months. How the heck am I still not getting beat by these guys? What the heck? Granted, they're high schoolers, but I was still like, I'm not very fast anymore. <laughs> yeah, your speed decreases, but yeah, your ability to to hang my, condition yeah, my ability, wise. Yeah, my condition was still like, I was surprised my aerobic capacity was still as well as it was. Um, yeah, that's it's interesting how long that stays. And if you just hit on it every, you don't have to hit on it, I don't think, as much as we do. But then there, that goes back to what I was talking about. Super training, there was a war on. Yeah, on that. Yeah, and that's, that's crazy to hear. That's crazy that a, that that happened. Uh, as, as I was reading that, I, I I really thought about, and I know everybody's got a different opinion on it, and I don't have an opinion on it one way or the other. But it almost goes back to that, very similar to the war on marijuana, back in the old days, right? I mean, it was all out. They really condemned it. They, you're going to die. You're going to get addicted. All these things. Well, now you see, as everything's turned, now it's now it's legal in most states. They've almost done the same thing with strength and conditioning. It was aerobic, aerobic, aerobic. Well, now you're starting to see guys. They're like, well, that doesn't provide all the answers. So you're you're almost seeing a 180. Yeah, when you see like, okay, why are we still getting our butts whooped if this is what we've been doing? Well. Unless you want to be the definition of insanity of keep doing the same thing over and over again and pray a different result will happen, you you just have to accept. Okay, we tried it multiple times and we gotta we gotta learn from this. But uh, back to back to your original like, so we had two days with football. Um, I did I don't really count one of our days because it was more of just a mobility circuit recovery at, right after a game. So we only have two days to train them. So we took that first day of hitting more of like a heavy effort kind of deal. Uh, we never did max effort, at least in the weight room, because we expect them to do max effort on the field. When you're trying to bulldoze a guy, you're doing a max effort, one, a one rep, kind of like a one rep max of trying to get through somebody as they're doing max effort against you. If that that makes sense, that at least that's how I interpreted it as uh, kind of like how Louis with conjugate was going about it. So we did like a heavy effort to maintain some of our absolute strength. If not, then improve a little bit, and then more towards when uh when we have game time, we go into more of a dynamic effort, a power day. Just we're moving fast as shit. Um just trying to literally just move fast. That's it. That's it. We're trying to get semi light, semi heavy weights and try to hit a certain speed. 
Um, we don't have a force velocity kind of uh, system, but she, that's where coach's eye it, it comes to play. Because a couple of times, uh, you probably have experienced it yourself, where um, certain guys will have certain egos. And we tried to explain to them, A, so it's 70% we're touching for three reps. It should feel very easy because you should be able to potentially hit like 12 reps about 12 reps and a lot of them we saw like the first two weeks fail on it and we're like what did we just get done saying <laughs> that was, that was that's, a hiccup. <laughs> that's a very hard concept to teach athletes is i know what it feels like that's the point how fast can you move it and exactly. well, I yeah. think I, I think I could go up a little bit. I don't, I'm not asking you to go up a little bit. I'm asking you to move this faster. Uh, that that's, you bring up a really good point there. It, it's. Yeah. And I mean, I don't, I don't blame them. Like, uh, I, I've done that mistake myself in my athletic career. Like I was like, but coach, this bench feels super easy. I know I could keep up with these guys. And he's like, stop. No, we're trying. And then would set me down and this is this is when i started becoming curious to the field because he explained to me and all the science behind it but when he explained it to me i was like oh that's really interesting because I, I love to train i love athletics uh, i've always been uh, an athlete but this was when uh, my heart and soul was trying to become a dentist so i stayed stubborn of trying to further educate myself in the field yeah clear communication is the only thing that seems to help if, if you can get them to understand that if you're moving this fast enough, you're essentially moving your max. So if we can get you to move your max three times, as opposed to a heavier weight that will not equal your max, we're gaining ground. And uh, sometimes yeah. sometimes it takes a little math on the whiteboard to show them. But uh, when they finally get it, you really see a change in their performance. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, a lot of... We saw a lot of success once they stopped with the ego stuff in terms of at least how they feel. Um, season didn't go exactly as planned, and we're trying to correct it. Yeah, we're we're a brand new staff. It was a brand new football staff, and so it's kind of that learning curve. And I I appreciate um, the head strength coach here. He was fully transparent with it. He was like, "Hey, this is my first time with you guys. I'm just trying to get to know you. We might have some bumps in the road, but." We're gonna figure, we're gonna figure this shit out. <laughs> and I like where you were heading there, where you consider the game max effort, and I think that mm -hmm. gets forgot about some, especially like let's take an endurance athlete in mind. You know, uh, that that cross country race they run during the week has to be considered for the volume, and then the rest of the week, you have to add that in, don't you? Yeah, hundred percent. Like even the regular training for most of the time, they would tell me they got done with like 12 to 20 miles of just running. And I was like, she like it, my knees started hurting just hearing that. <laughs> well, I think the reason why I say that is I think sometimes we look at the game day as some mythical amount of energy that comes from somewhere other than our bodies and that it doesn't affect anything. Well, then now right. we haven't taken that into consideration. So after your cross country race, well, now you have them out there running miles upon miles during the week. Well, that, that, that wear and tear has to eventually show up. Yeah. And it, it always, it always exposes itself. Uh, whenever you're overtraining, um, just overreaching, like it could be still functional, but then you go like, Hey, I've seen this dude, uh, go like two minutes faster what what's going on or even like 30 seconds faster um is he feeling a little off is she feeling a little off what's going on and then you just have to look at okay we've done this much volume and the body you have to remember the body it only knows what stress it doesn't know how to differentiate the type of stresses it handles it just knows it's being stressed out and on top of like they're training a ton and I mean a ton, you then have the social pressures because when you are an athlete and you're wanting to be at an elite at level, the so your social life is going to suffer. It, it just is. 
you're going to be looked at weird or, or you know, a nerd or whatever, because you're like, Hey, I got to go to study hall. I don't care if I have whatever GPA, it could be, it could be an amazing GPA. You could deal with somebody with a 4.0 and they're like, no, I want to maintain this 4.0 because I have pride in that. I'm either second string or first string on my team. And I'm able to beat you academically. Like there's that comp competitive side. And so you have those stresses happening and then it, you know, it, you then have the stresses of just uh, family. You're not seeing them as well. And you, who knows uh, what other kind of stresses are happening that maybe they, they don't feel comfortable talking to you about, but you as a coach need to understand, like learn your athlete and know, okay, is he a, a slacker or is she like, okay, something's off because normally she, she's above and beyond and high energy. What's going on? Now I've seen on your page, you do an ex a huge amount of back work. Is that something that is exclusive to you or down there? Do you guys focus a lot of time on backs? I'm, I'm a really big component of the post chain just because we're typically anteriorly dominant. Um, and I even do that with myself just to get a feel of what, what I'm putting pe them through. Um, it's also a great way to, all right, we're gaining some volume. We're able to gain mass while all, at the same time, we're able to recover pretty easily because usually you hear like lower back problems happen a lot. And so how do you, how do you strengthen it? Well, it might not necessarily be, okay, we're just squatting a ton or any of that. No, you got to find the root. All right. We have this entire area for your, your core. The lower back is just some factor. So are we weak in the upper abdominal? So even if I am doing a ton of back, I have to realize, and I, I do get a little lost with it when I'm doing a ton of back because I probably emphasize a little too much on the post chain sometimes, but, um, it just, it, it's, a uh, variant I, I do do a lot of it though um yeah if that answered your question i kind of rambled on a little bit my bad <laughs> well to to build on some of what you do for yourself you've done some bodybuilding stuff and you hear coaches say all the time well we're not creating bodybuilders we're creating athletes and that is 100 percent accurate but is there anything from the bodybuilding world that flows over to the strength world yeah i mean uh, it, if you want to get stronger, I'm sorry, you got to get hypertrophy. Like, and that's the foundation of what bodybuilding is. Now, bodybuilding, uh, it only does one type of hypertrophy, which just create a bunch of muscle cells. And they neglect the second hypertrophy, which is just making the muscle cells uh, denser. And so as long as you understand that, you do a ton. And this is part of what I I've learned from conjugate is when you do single joint stuff, yeah, you're going to get hypertrophy into the muscle belly, but you're doing a ton of that hypertrophy work or that bodybuilding fluff to strengthen the tendons and ligaments. So it keeps up with your muscle hypertrophy. Um, so that way, you know, a lot of people that neglect it, you, you hear like how something tore um, because they didn't accumulate that kind of adaptation. But uh, that's the only thing I see from bodybuilding besides then the nutrition aspect. Like, we can learn a ton because w what are bodybuilders constantly trying to do? It's not just they know the macros. They're like, okay, I need to also know the micros as well so that I get my body to look and feel a certain way. Well, if I could take that and turn it into, okay, how do I take that knowledge into a performance based, then if they feel good, then they're going to perform good. If they feel like crap in a sense because they're eating like a ton of Doritos or um, having a lot of pizza and not really focusing on a don't listen to like uh, and these are extreme diets like a carnivore or anything even though I see benefits if you have certain dietary needs uh, you still need to get your fruits vegetables carbs are your friends you need to get those whole grains and then you need to get and this is going to tick off some vegans, but you should eat meat. Um, our body is able to digest it. 
our teeth structure is designed to be able to handle it. So clearly it's not going to harm you. And then a plant base, you have to mix amino acids to create that whole, whole protein as opposed to what eggs can do and what beef, chicken can do. Um, and eggs, I, I strongly encourage everybody to eat eggs because of how enriched of leucine it is. And that's the main component that helps with muscle building and recovery. Like you can't recover without having a balanced diet. You can't, uh, you can hit all the protein you want, but if your micros are down, your immune system's now going to be down. Now you're not able to train because now we're going to back set just because uh, you, you got sick. So th that's the only avenues I've seen bodybuilding help. If we're talking about a performance of like, oh, we should do these lifts consistently. No, you got to stress it in a neurological way, not just, all right, we're going to do as many reps as possible. No, you're getting plenty of that volume on the field. Yes, I'm going to add some volume to add muscle building, but not, in, not like how bodybuilders do. The one point that you said in there that I, I think could have a little bit of carryover is the hypertrophy strengthening the ligaments, the tendons, the fascia. So now that you set yourself up where you can maybe absorb more of the forces we were talking about earlier on in the podcast, well, I understand, you know, a lot of the weight rooms don't have time to do a huge repetition method in there that maybe neglecting that is actually contributing to not gaining the absorption we'd like to have. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, because uh, there is that the stigma, like you said, um, where there's a lot of strength coaches that are like, oh, we're, do we're not doing this bodybuilding bullshit. And it's like, well, we can add, it shouldn't be your main focus, but it's like powerlifting. You know, I'm not going to train you like a powerlifter, but I can't just be ignorant and bliss of, you know, there's certain things we can take from it and put it into the program so I can hopefully have some kind of carryover when you go into your sport. Same with Olympic weightlifting. I, I can't ignore, okay, I this is a, another way of getting certain triple extensions into my ankles, hips, and knees. And then there's a, it's another way of teaching deceleration without me actually needing to say anything. So like we, there's a lot of, it's a lot of things we can learn to really like conjugate everything into one thing. Right. And the only time hypertrophy is not going to, well, and I don't even know how I want to say that. I would imagine your sprinters, you don't want to expose them to a ton of hypertrophy because you're looking for a mass specific athlete, but your football guys, you know, your wrestlers, things like that, that, that might need that body armor. You're kind of killing a couple birds with one stone. Yeah, like uh, exactly what you said. Like it could be a form of body armor. Like if I have more cushion, I have bigger shoulders. Now it's going to be harder for somebody to smash it and then dislocate it. You know, uh, will that guarantee it will never happen? No, but now you have more of a protective measure, and it's this. It's kind of uh, track. It's a multitude of things. Like it depends on what event. If I want to do more of a hypertrophy thing. Like if I'm dealing with a thrower or a just thrower or um, a high jumper, maybe hypertrophy will be more of a factor in certain areas of body. Um, but if I'm dealing with like a distance runner, like the mile, even though the, the mile is becoming more of a sprint, to be honest. Um, but if, if I'm dealing with a sprinter, maybe I shouldn't really work too much on just building as much mass as possible uh, because it could hinder them, make them slower on accident. I should more have hit that neurological adaptation to be able to fire up their motor units as quickly as possible. Yeah, you have to understand the sport you're training for and what allowances there are and what you can get away with. Yeah, like cross country, it wouldn't make any sense to make them build like a linebacker. <laughs> right, like, that, that muscle eats a lot of oxygen. Yeah, like it's, yeah, that like that would hinder them way too much. They, they would just look at me like I'm crazy trying to do that. And yeah. I, I wouldn't blame them. <laughs> and they spend most of their, their time in a catabolic state, so I don't even know if you how much you could get on them. 
yeah, and that's another thing. Like, if you're dealing with cross country, like, how much muscle building can could you actually do? Because they're always in a catabolic state. Like, it might actually instead of bulk, it might actually make them even thinner and waste away their glycogen storages more than you would like. So, it, it, yeah, it's it's a lot of fun to really think about all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, are are you with strength building? I think you need it for cross country athletes, just so you can hopefully fill in the hole you're digging. It's almost like you got two shovels going at the same time. One's pulling out, one's hopefully putting in. And then food obviously plays a huge part in that too. But trying to level out the catabolic nature of the sport will how much does strength training improve overall athletics there? Yeah, like you don't want to, you know, empty the bucket or overfill it. You know, you're trying to make a good balance and that's where uh, thankfully being the the coach we have a good relationship we're texting each other trying to get our schedules all corrected um let each other know okay what are they doing today like a couple of times he told me hey they they were looking pretty worn out from today and so i just changed it to a pure mobility day and they would just give me a sigh of relief and i'm like yeah i'm not gonna bury you in the ground of telling you hey get under the bar or something no it's okay Let's just help recovery. If I can get you to do mobility, now you're going to have better blood circulation. And now, uh, hopefully, it's going to give you some more of a rest period because I'm not going to fully have them stretch because now it's creating more muscle damage. But I'm, I'm hoping that just helps them also reduce stress. So now that cortisol levels are down, they're able to adjust. It's just another way of helping recovery. Yeah, and you have to be adaptable and be able to change your program on the fly. Right, yeah, and that's another thing of, like, you can't just be stubborn or close-minded. It's like, hey, I'm technically a like a public servant. It's like, hey, sure, um, I could be, like, a personal trainer where I'm like, oh, I don't care, you're going to do whatever I say. Or I could be, hey, I'm trying to make you the best athlete possible. If we got to take today or this week off, because we we did something wrong then we're going to find another avenue doesn't mean you're not going to do anything don't get me wrong but we'll go different routes of like all right let's do more mobility stuff or let's do um and it might sound weird but let's do some yoga where it's just hey let's lay down turn off the lights and just, just calm down you know not think about how school is going not think about how the social life family or what your sport is just completely relaxed you know it, it's just one of those things you got to consider and there's probably a lot of merit to that and i would imagine more athletes could use that than we probably take into consideration yeah uh, it, i didn't get exposed to like the benefits of it until uh, way later when our uh, uh, a teammate of mine he, he's french um, we would call him frenchy and he was like hey uh, Seabass, you want to join me for yoga? And I was like, the heck did you just say yoga? But I was like, you do this all the time? And he's like, yeah, like three times a week. And I was like, all right, well, this guy's a, star a starter on our team. Um, and when he graduated, he, he was a guy that 4.0 got an engineering degree. I, he's now right now playing pro, um, trying to get into the Olympics with the French na national team. So I was like, okay, if this dude always kicks my butt, I'm going to mimic a little bit of what he does. And if I respond well, then I'm going to stick to it. And sure enough, I started getting out of the water better. Um, I started swimming better, started loosening up instead of moving like a robot so much. It, it, it helped. I saw a lot of benefits of now you, a lot of less self-doubt. You now just let the body do what it's been trained and prepared to do. Yeah, there's just so many different things that we can do to, to improve performance that, that it's so hard to touch on all of them. I mean, between Tim's units and everything else, there's just so much stuff out there. And unless you have an unlimited budget backing you, some of yeah. those avenues are tough to do. Yeah, some of the some of them are. And this is this is an avenue where you don't need like a ice bath or something fancy. It's just literally Turn off the lights, have it dark. Um, if you want to with your phone or whatever, 
like soothing music and just tell them to close their eyes and relax. Like you could tell them, hey, flex all the muscles in your body, tell them to hold for like 10 seconds and then let go. Just relax, let the body sink into the ground and then just have them do that for like 20 minutes, 15 minutes. And then when they're completely relaxed, let them up and then do some kind of mobility. That way, now they're mentally recovering and physically recovering. Yeah, and you could take it a step further, and you probably wouldn't be too far in the hole if you just let them take a nap. Yeah, seriously. Like, uh, you have to remember their kids. Uh, as I mentioned, bones. <laughs> uh, they're going to want to party. So there's going to be those things as well. So. You know, uh, everybody's been young. It's like, yeah, you should enjoy your youth. Like, you, even me, like I, I enjoy every now and then. I'd be a hypocrite to tell them, don't do X, Y, and Z. No. That's part of it, right? And you just got to, as a strength coach, you've got to understand that that is part of it and then work around it because they're not changing anytime soon. Yeah, you just, um, just got to be like, hey, I'm going to educate you of like what it does and what it can lead to if you do these things in the wrong connotations you know if you're doing it to escape reality or try to handle certain tough situations then you might want to reevaluate it of why you're doing this now if you're doing this because you know it's like every now and then just as a social thing or every now and then because you feel like hey let's have a good time then by all means it's okay like, it's fine it's fine but you need to you need to be smart about it. <laughs> well, Coach, I know I've had you on here quite a while, and you you've got other things to do. But man, I really appreciate your time. I know we've known each other on Instagram for a while, so to finally sit down and be able to talk about some of these things has been really great. So I really appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate you having having me on here. <laughs>